Okay, we're recording. Right. So, hello all. Um, oops, this. This is the talk and it's title, The Blockchain. Magic probably doesn't happen. How to sell a hash tree as a tech revolution. And that's my book that's just out, Libra Shrugged, the story of Facebook's Libra cryptocurrency plan, which is readily available. As students, you of course know that books exist on LibGen, as you may have heard. So yeah, if you're poor, that's where to go. <laughs> so this is me. Um, basically, I'm a cryptocurrency journalist, and I try to approach it as being a finance journalist specializing in these weird things um which is probably a good way to approach it because you know when you talk about money then people always go a bit funny and there's always something to talk about and very much so in crypto but anyway so i started as a music journalist um i moved to it because it pays a lot better i am a unix sysadmin i have a day job um i started following bitcoin in about 2011 or so and i thought well this is interesting of course it's got a pile of things wrong with it but who knows what will happen and uh, all sorts of things happened so i then started a book called attack of the 50-foot blockchain i started that in late 2016 um it came out just in time for the bitcoin bubble of 2017 it was like perfectly timed so <coughs> Then this sort of writing about cryptocurrencies and blockchains thing turned into a side gig and it's still going. So whenever I do a talk, there's like a panel or whatever discussion, there's always someone who comes up afterwards and whispers, what actually is a blockchain? Because they don't know. They assume everyone else in the room knows, but they just missed it. So... I like I understand as part of Sam's class, you have to like literally program a blockchain at some stage. So many of you will know, but if you don't, this will help review it. It's just like, it's really simple. So we have a simple accounting ledger, let's say. Uh, it is um, just transactions, you know, going from someone to someone else, there's a date and there's an amount. So we have this accounting ledger and we made it publicly available for transparency. How do we make sure that everyone's got an accurate copy? How do we guard against typos or fraud? Well, there are obvious ways to do this. Like I'm presuming you know what a hash is. You uh, take any chunk of data whatsoever, large or small, you feed it through a function and you end up with a string of digits which um, are a hash of that code of that of that data and the great thing about hashes is a really good hash one that's cryptographically solid you cannot tell anything about the original data from the hash right it's basically a one-way function and you know that if even one bit is different in the original data the hash will be totally different so if two chunks of data have the same hash, you can be pretty sure they're the same data. And faking a hash is nearly impossible. Like the sun will burn out first. Um, there are hashes that people have come up with collisions for. So realistically, the life of a hash is maybe a couple of decades, but that's usually good enough for our purposes. Um, so we have this le ledger. We've got a hash on each record, so we know each record is okay. So what if we have a lot of entries? How do we make sure that the whole ledger has integrity? What do we do if some miscreant decides to add an entry or take out an entry? So there's a simple trick we can do, and that is we hash all the hashes. This avoids hashing a thousand entries, say. Like, that'd be annoying. If you added a thousand the first entry, you'd have to rehash all of them. This way you don't have to do that. Now, the nice thing there um, is that basically these hashes, if you hash the hashes, then that has the same cryptographic guarantees as just the hash of all the data. It won't give you the same number, but it'll give you a number you can trust just as much. 
if you know the hash of the hashes, that completely defines this table, right? If you change one byte of that table and you run all the hashes and the hashes of the hashes will be wrong. This um, is a really useful construct. It means you can distribute it. You can easily verify it and it's basically impossible to fake. This is called a Merkle tree and was invented in 1979 because nothing about the blockchain is new, right? It builds on decades of work and it has the same cryptographic guarantees. But if you want to change any of the data, you can do so a lot quicker. Um, this is widely used in things like Git and ZFS and all sorts of places, anywhere where you want an append only ledger. It's an obviously useful thing. And with uh, most blockchain type cryptocurrencies or even enterprise blockchains for other functions, what they do is they chain the blocks. So you have a table of hashes, of hashed little lines. Then you take that hash and you tack it onto the next block and you hash that. And you take that and you tack it on the next one and hash that. Um, this is like a sort of weirdly designed form of the same sort of construct, the hash, the hashes of hashes construct, the Merkle tree. Um, and this is called, it's a chain of blocks. It's called the blockchain. So this is pretty simple and elegant. It works right well. Um, but somehow people have decided that this blockchain is the magical thing that will change the world and turn civilization upside down. And they make all sorts of nearly magical claims about it. So where do these claims come from? Well, the answer to that is the first use case of the thing that we now call the blockchain, and that is Bitcoin. So Bitcoin was an idea for an electronic peer-to-peer -peer cash. So digital cash is obviously a useful idea. You know, we um, have internet, we have computers, we can move data between each other. You know, um, notes and coins are fiddly and annoying. So what if we could send stuff by email? That'd be good. Um, Maybe we want to keep track of everything. So we could use this ledger for our cash. Um, someone is authorized to add new entries and everyone knows what the track record is. Who gets to add new entries? So the answer we currently use is that a central authority does, like your bank maybe, or PayPal or Zelle or whoever. So the trouble there is that Bitcoin's founders had some unusual requirements. So Bitcoin was never really a project to build a payment processing system. It was really founded to make money that would work a particular way. It was very ideological in its founding. The founders were very strong on their principles. It was extreme libertarianism with no authority whatsoever. Like not just somewhat libertarian or let's have a lot less rules or whatever. No rules, no boundary on business, no nothing. So they needed something that had no central authority, none whatsoever. Um, so the threat model there was that governments would come in and take away their money for taxes or whatever. Um, so they needed something that had no central authority, um, no ability to reverse transactions, otherwise someone might force you to reverse a transaction. And they needed it such that it could run without anyone running the system no administrator. Um, they also wanted a completely rigid gold standard so it doesn't work like actual money, it works like um, gold is the money or digital gold. They were very very much wanted this to work a bit like gold except even less interesting than actual gold. Um, they had a lot of weird pseudo-economics that doesn't work. Like we went off, we the world had the gold standard as we knew the thing from about 1790 something up to the, the 1930s and it was finally killed in 1971 um, and it didn't work very well um, it turns out monetary policy is a bit more stable in practice this is of course all arguable points but um, we went off the gold standard because it wasn't working so where do bitcoins come from how do they run this system 
There are going to be 21 million Bitcoins in total. They're slowly released up till about the year 2140. New Bitcoins are issued every 10 minutes. It's more or less 10 minutes. It, it, they change the, it every now and then, but it's about 10 minutes to average. The way to do this with no central authority is they make it into a lottery. So this is how Bitcoin mining and cryptocurrency mining in general actually works. You get a block of prospective transactions because they're going out on the Bitcoin network and you um, look at what the transactions are that are waiting in the pool of transactions, the mempool that's waiting to be processed. What you do is you grab a block full of transactions. You then guess a random number, which is called the nonce, and you add it to the end. Then you take the hash of that. So we can see on this diagram, we've got the hashes of all the transactions in that particular block. Then we tack the nonce on. And then if we get a hash that has, is a small enough number, because when you get a hash, it's a number that you end up with at the end. If it's got enough leading zeros, that's the way Bitcoin does it, then you win the Bitcoins. And if you don't, you guess again. So you might see in newspapers that people talk about Bitcoin as doing lots of complex calculations. They're not complex, they are simple calculations. It does very simple calculations very, very fast. And that's 77 times 10 to the 21st guesses every 10 minutes with one winner. Um, because this is how mining works. You compete on how much computing power you can throw at guessing numbers and calculating hashes. And if you guess wrong, then you lose and you have to try again. And maybe you can put on more computers and spend more electricity. So proof, this is called proof of work mining. It would be many called proof of waste. It is literally showing your commitment that you deserve the Bitcoins because you've wasted enough power on trying to compete for the Bitcoins. Now, obviously, if you throw more computers at it, you'll win more often. So what they do is if too many people win, they make it harder next time. Like every 2016 blocks, two weeks, they change the difficulty. And if it's too easy, they make it harder. And if it's too hard, they make it easier. So this ends up in what's called a red queen's race, where you're running faster and faster to stay in the same place. So what this means is that um, it ends up spiraling out of control. And Bitcoin now uses as much power as the entire country of Austria. Like that's 0.1 to 0.5% of the world's electricity supply estimated. Like that's just literally wasted guessing numbers. It's doing no useful work except running literally the most inefficient payments system in human history. And it still does only about seven transactions per second, in practice about four or five, which is the same since 2009 when it was running on its creator's PC. So it's literally anti-efficient. The more you use, used, the um, less efficient it gets. So presumably we get something fabulous for all this power use. So what Bitcoin promised, it would be decentralized and trustless. Now decentralized there means that there's no one who can take control of the system. The threat model was governments, but also against bad actors. Um, and trustless means you don't have to trust some other person as the state of the system. There's no central authority who you have to refer to. Anyone can look at the uh, blockchain and decide what it is. You don't have to trust anyone to perform a transaction. They promised it would be fast and free. They promised it would be uncensorable and irreversible. The government cannot stop you making any transaction you want and they cannot force you to reverse a transaction. For the economic promises, there's no just printing money because Bitcoin actually came out just during the financial crisis of 2008. And when some people were upset that governments were basically printing money and throwing it into the economy as fast as possible, much as they have this year. And for the same reason, because the system was seizing up. There's a strictly limited supply of Bitcoin. So if the whole world runs on Bitcoin, then it'll be um, fabulous financial responsibility. 
Now, how did the promises work out? Surprisingly, they didn't work out so well. Bitcoin had re-centralized by about early 2014 because it has economies of scale. You know, the bigger you are, the more efficient you are, and that's a force tending to centralization. So at the moment, I checked just before, and today there's four mining pools that are issuing most of the Bitcoins. Um, so Bitcoin was fast and free up to about mid-2015. Then the transaction capacity filled, the few transactions per second, um, and suddenly it was all clogged. Everything was slow, annoying, transactions might get lost. Um, when Bitcoin got popular in the second Bitcoin bubble, because it was the first one in 2013, 2017 was the second one, um, it, prices peaked at an average fee of about $55 to get your transactions into a block. There was limited space in the block, so they ordered them by who was paying the most. Um, so yeah, so it is uncensorable. No one can stop you putting a transaction on the chain and it is irreversible. These turn out to be bad. Um, consumers really like having chargebacks available. If you do a new payment system, you'd better have really good customer service. Otherwise people aren't going to be confident in your system. They don't want to throw money into, thin, into um, a black hole maybe. Um, and the irreversibility also means that mistakes are fatal. One mistake, you've lost your coins. One scam, you've lost your coins. If I pick your pocket from the other side of the world, those are my Bitcoins now. Um, so all hacks, frauds and thefts are final and fat fingers. So you can't just print Bitcoins. The supply of Bitcoins is limited and it's quite unlikely the number of Bitcoins will ever increase beyond 21 million. But it's open source code. Anyone can fork it, make a copy, change a few parameters, and they've got a new coin. Um, it took a while for this to happen. You could first exchange Bitcoins for money reliably about late 2010. By mid-2011, people were starting to do these um, copies, which were called altcoins. Um, there are a thousand plus of these. They were basically the Bitcoin code with slight variations in most cases. Some people wrote new code bases. The market treats all of these as one pool of stuff called cryptos. So cryptographers get understandably upset at cryptocurrency being called crypto, um, but I'm afraid to, that it's a standard financial jargon term now. Um, if you look at cryptocurrency, you can always assume that crypto is short for cryptosporidium instead. Um, so yes, Bitcoin is just like gold if you could create new gold mines by cutting and pasting a previous gold mine. So there's all these altcoins. Can they fix the problems that Bitcoin has got? Um, so in a lot of ways, Bitcoin was like the first one. It was the prototype. It proved that you could even do this trick of having a completely uncontrolled thing that would serve as money-like tokens. So that was really interesting. I don't want to knock it. It was really, really interesting technically. That's different from feasible or a good idea, but it is interesting. But could it be improved? Um, there's other coins that use proof of work. Um, the other most famous one is Ethereum. So Ethereum is actually a new experimental thing. That was, it was experiment, new and experimental at the time. It's got smart contracts, which are basically little computer programs. They, they're in enterprise computing, you'd call these database triggers or stored procedures. They do something when an action happens on the blockchain. Um, so the analogy I use is if Bitcoin is like a spreadsheet, then Ethereum is like a spreadsheet with macros. So Ethereum is, of course, already clogging and they're desperately trying to make it faster. Um, there's, it clogs whenever anything popular happens on it, like a popular initial coin offering. Um, crypto kitties, which was cat pictures on Ethereum. So we know Ethereum cannot scale up to cat pictures. Um, the new one in 2020 has been DeFi, decentralized finance, which is like a bizarre financial shell game, which I'll probably not even try to explain in this talk. But um, yeah, so there's 
experimental new work. It's unfinished, not fully battle tested. Um, there's a few of them, IOTA, Hashgraph, Cardano. Um, there's one called Avalanche, which it might go somewhere, but it needs a full testing with a sufficiently hostile attacker. And in practice, the market hops from coin to coin as the old ones stop working. Like Bitcoin's first use case was to buy drugs on the Silk Road market. Um, so it was sort of useful for that. It, they didn't like using it, but since what they were doing was illegal, they um, needed something to use instead of dollars. So they used those. And it worked well for a while. There are a number of hazards, like it turns out that if you're using a permanent immutable append-only ledger and the public can see it, then doing crimes on it's probably a bit dumb. So people are still getting busted for their transactions on Silk Road. <laughs> um, users hop from coin to coin readily, the markets move, traders just use whatever's going up. So yeah, altcoins haven't really changed the situation. So what do we do? Um, perhaps is this blockchain thing useful? Will it change the world? So the promise is, this is what happens when a blockchain salesman comes up to your door. Any organization, all organizations have bureaucracy. Bureaucracy happens when you have two people in a room and you have to organize who does what, right? Then you write it down. Congratulations, you have bureaucracy. Civilization is the same thing except much, much bigger. So every organization has machinery. They want to do more stuff, they want to do it better, and they want to do it with less people. So blockchain promoters came along saying that blockchain could do that. Now the history of this was Bitcoin was losing its luster by about 2014. The price had just crashed the Silk Road market had just been busted. It seemed like weird financial scam money with drugs. It didn't have a good reputation. So a group of people at the JP Morgan Bitcoin interest group thought, Perhaps we can sell the software. We can sell it as blockchain, blockchain technology, or another euphemism, distributed ledger technology. Um, these were euphemisms for Bitcoin. Like distributed ledger technology does not mean the technology of ledgers that are distributed. It means blockchains as in cryptocurrency as in Bitcoin. Like otherwise you could just use shared Excel sheets. They're ledgers, they're distributed. All the promises are still Bitcoin promises, which even though it's not Bitcoin. Now here are the fabulous promises of blockchain. Basically these promises are a particular set of marketing promises, right? It's not any particular technology. Sometimes they don't even have the Merkle free ledger, but they just make a bunch of marketing promises saying it's a blockchain. So you get all this stuff because I'm calling it a blockchain. They're literally the same promises that were made for blockchain. You just change the buzzword. They'll claim it's decentralized, fast and free. Like who it's decentralized against. Because you know that in cryptography, you think in threat models. So who's the threat model here? Who is, who is the problem you're trying to protect against? They don't say. Um, they say that the blockchains are uncensorable, irreversible, immutable, and incorruptible. So it's true that it's really hard changing an append-only ledger. Um, anyone who's worked with Git, which is a version control system, and has tried changing the contents of a Git repository will discover that it really sucks. It's a pain on the backside and everything breaks. Um, so yeah, it's pretty irreversible. Um, but I mean, if it's run by a company, then you have a touchable entity that is legally responsible because it turns out technology does not work around legal responsibilities in practice. Um, they'll often say, add smart contracts. The hard bit is always done with smart contracts, which means on computers. But smart contracts are the magical proportion. I've seen ICO white papers, initial coin offering white papers, which are like literally they have a pile of users at one side, a pile of fabulous outcomes at the other side, and there's a great big box in the middle and they've written in it smart contract. So they're not contracts, they're not smart, that's a marketing term, they're just computer programs. 
So what about, so we don't want to run it like Bitcoin because it's permissionless. No one controls it, but if you're in business, someone's responsible. It wastes a country's worth of electricity. You probably don't want that. So they often have proposed permissioned blockchains. Um, like, you know, everyone who's involved, they're all known, authorized participants. You don't want your back office out there on the internet. That'd be ridiculous. So functionally, this is a slow distributed data store, extremely robust, um, but basically it's a database. Like you are not going to get magical blockchain results out of that, but they totally promise them. Like in, there are almost no blockchains in production use. The main use case for smart contracts is ICO tokens, um, which are literally just selling, you, you make up cryptographic objects, then you sell them claiming magical properties for them, then people trade them. It's really that simple. Um, so there's a lot of press releases, there's pilot programs funded by the vendor. The, a straight majority of these are from IBM. If you look at press coverage in the last five years of blockchains, most of it will trace back to an IBM press release. I was surprised when I looked and like started counting just how many were from IBM, quite a lot of them. So there are some real projects. There, all of these have been hyped up as use cases for blockchain, which will definitely change the world and turn everything upside down. And they're all a bit less impressive when you look closely. The World Food Program is a, um, thing run by um, the United Nations. It's for refugees, like people dispossessed of their homes. They go to a new country. What do they do? How do we feed them? What sort of program do we need? So it turns out these are just normal people. They've just been rendered homeless. So just give them money and they buy food and live their lives. This works out really well. So this is a good program. It does a great job. And they put in an Ethereum based system, it saved them 98% on their overheads down to 2%. And they put this as a fabulous success case for Ethereum, like running a private Ethereum as just the software. It wasn't that impressive because all the savings was because they took the fund disbursement, giving money to people in house. And um, the actual Ethereum is just a private instance on a single user and they haven't got anyone else to join their Ethereum blockchain yet. They've been trying for a few years. So it's a good program, does good work, and it uses a blockchain backend for no good reason. I mean, as a system administrator, I wouldn't rip it out. If it works, leave it. But you know, it's like a bizarre architecture choice because actually really the point is the guy loves Ethereum. Um, Walmart and I, IBM have done supply chain trials they talked this up a lot. They got front page of section B of the New York times with this one. It's like everything, the whole back end lives on the IBM cloud and it's all run by Walmart and suppliers use it because Walmart says, use this. Like it's just the back end data store. Um, but saying Walmart and IBM have a new database doesn't get you into the New York times. Um, Maersk, the world's biggest shipping company um, with IBM, they're doing the same sort of thing and it's much the same thing. And there's like press coverage of the vendors openly wondering what the blockchain bit is supposed to do. Um, there was a company called votes who decided to put voting on the blockchain, like which was an attempt to make electronic voting an even worse idea than it was already. So what they did was they just ran it as the back end. They collected votes, they uh, use blockchain to transmit the votes and they printed a paper ballot. And it, it's like, it's as if they had not ever discovered that SSL websites exist. You can send data around the world pretty securely um, if you have a known person at the other end. And these are members of the military. They're extremely well detailed people. They have full biometric data on them, everything. So yeah, and the vote system turned out to be very badly written and insecure and it couldn't scale up and failed in all sorts of ways, but you can do a web search on votes and you'll find all sorts of fabulous stuff about how 
great they are. Initial coin offerings, that's the thing where you print a bunch of tokens and then sell them. And the only, the real use case is that people can go off and trade them and speculate on them and make money. It's an unregistered penny stock offering. The process is you state a problem, you say tokens can solve this problem. And there are no other steps. Um, some of these are bizarre. There was one for dentistry, Denticoin, uh, which got caught up in the 2017 bubble. And in early 2018, the, uh, there was a tweet that the tooth fairy is now richer than Bill Gates. Technically it was. Um, so, you know, <laughs> there's tokens for everything. The real use case is speculation. And a lot of these people just disappear with the money. The trouble with blockchain is the irreversibility means it's a great place for scammers. Um, you see, people talk about the fabulous potential of blockchain. What they do is they make nonsense claims using technology as a sort of selling point and saying, oh, you don't understand it. It's blockchain, but trust me, it works. This is always flim flam. Um, You've had a series of di different technologies over the years and they all have the same sort of scam. And in every case, it's been the promise that you can get rich without work. Um, and it turns out that actually you can't get rich for free. Um, so the same thing has been, pro but people will say and believe anything if they think they might get rich for free. Like there's been ran these scams in the era of altcoins, ICOs, enterprise blockchain projects. Um, in 2020, the new one's been DeFi, which was funded by a lot of crypto venture capitalists who thought that they could make this stuff look profitable and maybe get ordinary people back in, build up a really popular mainstream bubble. Like in 2017, then the actual dollars would flow in. It didn't work. Like right now, the Bitcoin price is really, really high. It's back up to 18,000 and something dollars which is pretty impressive, but it's like peculiarly bloodless. There's like no massive popularity amongst the populace. Trading volumes aren't very high. Um, there's a lot of people talking about shortages of actual dollars to pay their electricity bills for their miners. It's bizarre. There's a lot of shenanigans going on. Basically, a lot of people forgot that magic doesn't happen. The, the crypto space has a lot of really good sincere people. I've made a lot of friends here, but it also has a lot of repeat scammers. Like you have people who have been convicted of mail fraud before and they discovered crypto and went, woohoo, suckers. And um, you basically have good naive people who honestly want to change the world and don't know much about economics or history. And then you have scammers to prey upon them. And then you have the ones who are actually the suckers, but they think they're the scammer. And they're a fabulously um, scammable bunch of people. There's shenanigans at all levels. Um, you can totally get rich in crypto, by the way. If you want to be an investor and play the markets, you can absolutely get rich, but you're much more likely to lose your shirt because it's a pool full of sharks and you look tasty. So I would apply caution. I'll never say you can't get rich in cryptos because you totally can. Um, so the thing is to keep in mind. Magic doesn't happen. If you see something that looks magical, if it's just too good to be true, it, then it is actually too good to be true. The first thing you should do is look for what's wrong. If someone promises magic, that's the bat signal for scammers. There are lots of scammers and suckers and suckers who think they're the scammer. If anything sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So, I'll end there and that's my address, my uh, web page and my Twitter, which I'm on about 16 hours a day. Um, if, if this is now the time to take questions, anyone? Well, I'd like to hear about Libra. I looked at your book. Libra is just over, right? It's not even worth worrying about anymore. Is that right? <laughs> so Facebook came up with this amazing scheme for Libra their own cryptocurrency, like four Bitcoiners basically started inside the company. Yeah. Uh, they wanted to do something like Bitcoin, but something that was stable and people could use it for money, 
like literally just as money and that would be run by sensible people meaning them and they sold this idea to um, the higher ups at Facebook to Mark Zuckerberg um, and they launched this thing they didn't actually start it what they launched was just the paper pr proposing it publicly um, every regulator and financial minister and governor and central banker in the world went ha ah, no this is terrible you are not doing this because it had a whole bunch of stuff wrong with it um, it didn't make sense economically um, if you had facebook scale of users because they were thinking in terms of two billion people using this thing then the working flow you know you have money on balance in paypal or venmo or whatever it's very like that they would have maybe a trillion dollars of float just in libra just the working float in the system and that's a large enough pile of money to break markets in fact the way they had it set up was to work very like a money market fund and you know the thing is that there's one thing that regulators fear that gives them the nightmares is the idea of a 2008 financial crisis happening again Facebook gave them the plan that was what happened in 2008 and were actually surprised when the regulators went, hell no, you're not doing that. So that version of the idea is dead. They came back earlier this year with Libra version two, which is, I would describe it as PayPal, but it's Facebook. It's just dollars on Libra and pounds and euros. Um, they weren't going to do their weird basket currency reserve thing, um, which would take me another 15 minutes to explain properly. Uh, and they had various other protections in place. I don't think this is enough either. I think they'll go live with something that's called Libra. But also the other threat model is that um, what if a company does this less ineptly? Because private control of money is a very dangerous and scary idea like all of this stuff should be public social goods in a lot of views private currencies don't have a great history so if you see central bankers will often write lots of papers about regulating stable coins when they say stable coin it's literally always a euphemism for libra you read the papers it's about libra libra and also libra but the threat model is, say, someone competent doing, like, say, an Amazon stablecoin or a General Electric stablecoin or something like that. So they don't want that to happen without a lot of regulation because I've got to stress, financial regulators, ministers, governments in America, Europe, the UK, they love business. They love people going into business. They love going into finance. They want you to go out and make a great big pile of money. That, that's great. But what they don't want you to do is do a big thing that can break the system. And they were afraid Libra would break the system because Facebook is too big and they don't trust Facebook. So yeah, that's the state of Libra at the moment. Well, what about Tether? Oh, Tether. Let me explain Tether. Wow. So Tether is one of these shenanigans in the Bitcoin market at the moment. And a lot of people, including me, think it's a lot of the reason why it's the number says $18,000. Um, a tether is a fake dollar or it's a dollar substitute token. The idea is you give a dollar to tether and you get a tether. It's worth a dollar. It moves like a dollar at the speed of cryptocurrency. None of this tedious financial regulation cross border or whatever like that. It's mostly used in cryptocurrency trading markets as a substitute dollar. Like it's not a retail thing like Libra was. Tether is the most common crypto traders stable coin which is where the word came from um, tether has a number of problems firstly the backing doesn't appear to entirely exist like they say that there's 18 billion dollars worth of tethers out there and there's no evidence anyone's come up with this money no one knows where it's kept there are no audits the New York Attorney General has been investigating them and Tether confessed that they were only had 74% of the dollars they were supposed to. The rest is backed by uh, Bitcoins or loans to other companies, um, maybe loans of Tethers and then back the Tethers with the loan or other such um, quick sleight of hand. 
I don't know what's going on there. They had 4 billion tethers in March. Then Bitcoin crashed when the rest of the markets crashed, when the pandemic uh, lockdown started. So everything crashed. Everyone went screaming towards US dollars, which are the most stable currency in the world. And they just, Tether went, well, Bitcoin's crashing. We'd better print some tethers. And suddenly there were a ton of tethers coming out. Like their serious opinion that about at least half of the 2017 bubble was fueled by tethers. Whenever it went down, they'd pump a few more tethers into the system. Tether is also favored by the sort of crypto exchange that can't get US dollar banking because they're too shonky for bankers to deal with. So, and the great thing about uh, crypto is no one can tell if you're anyone. If you have a website and a virtual machine on AWS, you can say you're an exchange. You can like accept Bitcoins and Tethers and various altcoins. And you can say, I'm an exchange, mate. Your money is safe with me. And, you know, in the real world, financial institutions have regulation because having a great big pile of other people's money, other people have very strong ideas on what you do with that, right? Even quite libertarian people, a lot of people in Wall Street are very libertarian minded. They think this is great, but they tend to prefer to work in a market that's somewhat stable and has a few rules because no one likes a crook. And in a society, people are eventually tend towards markets that are well run enough that you know that your money just won't be taken. So you're going to have regulation of some sort. But and Bitcoin is actually an excellent example of why we have regulation, because every shenanigan you can think of that happens when the regulators are asleep happens in Bitcoin. It's getting tightened down slowly as the years go on, but uh, regulators move very slowly. So yeah, um, Tether, I mean, maybe they have full backing for everything, but nobody knows because they won't tell anyone and there's no sign of it. So yes, it, it's a great big mystery. And if any other financial institution carried on like Tether does, within about a few weeks, you'd have the air raid sirens going off, but somehow they've kept this going for years. So I don't know what's going on there, but it's very interesting. I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole, but yeah. Now, around the time that um, Libra came out, I saw these ads for Gemini from the Winklevoss twins. Do you know about that? Yes. Um, so Bitcoin exchanges are of varying degrees of compliance with common decency. Uh, some are just scams. Some are reasonably well regulated. The biggest one is Coinbase. Um, which is based in the US and it has branches in other current countries. Coinbase are moderately well behaved. They're the biggest US dollar exchange. Gemini is not as big. So that was started by the Winklevoss twins who made mo their big fortune suing Facebook, which that they had a share in the idea of Facebook in the first place. What they did was they went off and bought a whole pile of Bitcoins. Um, I think it was a stash of seized Bitcoins that they bought at auction at a discount. And they set up an exchange called Gemini. So I will say that the whole point of Gemini is that they're regulated and well behaved. The whole thing they're trying to do is sell to Wall Street. So they put out ads saying there should be regulation or um, markets need rules. Like the theory that I said before, you know, people much prefer a market where you know your money just won't evaporate tomorrow. So, you know, even libertarians, strong libertarians tend to think that governments have a legitimate role in protecting property. So I've heard bad things and gossip about every exchange, but Gemini is actually the only one I've never heard a bad word about in that sense. Like they seem as above board as you can get. And that's great. What this results in is that they have much lower volumes than a lot of other exchanges because regulation, proper behavior is not a feature. Traders want a really good casino that they can have high rolling fun in and, you know, ignore the disquieting noises coming from the back room. Let's party on, roll, everything on red. I see a question in the chat, which I was thinking of. Uh, they did increase the block size of Bitcoin a couple of years back to increase the transaction rate. Did that work? Um, they didn't quite increase the block size. They put in a new feature called SegWit. So this is complicated and silly. Now, there's a thing in Bitcoin called the transaction ID, which is a hash of the transaction. Um, 
Now, you might think that a transaction ID could be used to identify a transaction. This turned out not to be the case. Um, this resulted in trouble because people would front run transactions in midair. Um, so like there's a Bitcoin block every 10 minutes. In that 10 minute period, there's transactions floating around on the Bitcoin blockchain. No, sorry, not on the Bitcoin blockchain, on the Bitcoin network, waiting for people to put them into a block. So people would replace transactions in midair because transactions were malleable. So a given transaction might have a different ID. And this is something you could do. This led to trouble because 10 minutes was quite slow. So a lot of places would accept a transaction when it was in midair before it'd be confirmed. Zero confirmation, it's called. And so this was obviously a problem that had to be fixed because you know you should be able to use an, a transaction ID to identify a transaction. So they came up with SegWit, which was very controversial because it was sort of messy and there was the politics of who was trying to do what with Bitcoin and so on. And that signed transactions in a different way so that the IDs could be used as IDs. And it had the other effect that you could fit more transactions in a block or the blocks could actually be a bit bigger. So the transaction rate was a bit higher if you're using SegWit addresses and it sort of slowly moved over to more SegWit addresses as time, time goes on. But yeah, so it was a slight increase. The other one that got my interest was IOTA. Uh, it seems to have totally crashed and burned. Uh, what do you think about that? I think these people, I will go so far as to say in public on YouTube that I think these people are nuts. Um, so IOTA was a bizarre scheme to uh, come up with a uh, currency for the Internet of Things. Like, so firstly, this presumes you need a currency for the Internet of Things. Then they did it based on a um, trinary virtual machine, not binary, but trinary. Then they talked up um, things like their partnership deals with Microsoft. This turned out to be that they'd rented a uh, machine on Azure. Um, then they had people going through their code looking for security holes. And they had security researchers report uh, problems, um, get threats from IOTA not to reveal them. Then they'd reveal them because, you know, you don't threaten security researchers. It doesn't go down well. Then they tried to sue the security researchers or threatened to sue them. Then they uh, claimed that they had actually put those in as open source copy protection. That if you use these code that they put out as the code, then you'd crash and burn and you should just use their binaries. Um, this, I can safely say that was bizarre behavior and was widely regarded as bizarre behavior. Then they were going to have a completely decentralized network that would have no control on it once they'd worked out how to get rid of the centralized controller. Um, this didn't work out. They still have the controller. And I can characterize the white paper for IOTA as time cube in LaTeX. It was bizarre. Um, I, I'm not a mathematician. I don't claim to be. Um, a pile of mathematicians I know went through it and went, this is nuts and this is nuts and that doesn't work. And it was great. And the present state of IOTA is that um, they have more or less fallen apart in internecine squabbles between the centralized administrators of it. Some people are alleged to have taken IOTAs that were from the launch and it's very, very messy. So yeah, IOTA is fabulous. So is there any use to this stuff at all? So many people are pouring so much money into it and it seems to have no value at all. So the value of it is that number goes up. There is no more interesting story in finance than a number going up. Um, a number going down is the second most interesting. So Bitcoin wanted to be a currency. It didn't really work out as that. It was a nice toy proof of concept, but it didn't work out as a production system, as a currency. So its use case at the moment is mostly speculation. There is a slight payment use case. If you want to send money internationally and you have a lot of trouble with bureaucratic currency controls, then 
you may want to use cryptocurrencies to get around it. Um, if you are someone from a marginalized group who wants to get receive money without um, being restricted from by banks that will won't accept people work stuff that's legal but um, is unfavored by banks like um, sex workers or cannabis you might have a use case for it um, that sort of thing but it's a very small payment use case a large speculative use case far too much of the payment use cases things like ransomware you lock someone's pc and demand a payment of bitcoins um or if the or ether it's that's a real problem for cryptocurrencies actually because that sort of thing gets governments determines that you don't have a real use case and you should be heavily locked down so there's a lot of heavy restrictions going into place on um cryptocurrency movements the FATF travel rule financial financial action task force like you know how I said that regulators love people going into business they're not here to douse the party they want you to go out and get rich so the FATF are the people who are there to douse the party they're the cops they don't want you having fun they want to make sure that money is traced because they want to fight terrorist funding and criminal funding and there's nothing positive about ransomware so the Treasury Department in the US has opined that uh, ransomware payments would constitute terrorist or criminal financing because a lot of the people receiving this stuff are on the sanctions list. So you don't want to do that. The point there is to remove the incentive to pay ransomware and make it much more illegal to just pay the ransom. So, yeah, um, a lot of authorities are not happy with the misuses of cryptocurrency. I mean, I think that's good. This stuff is probably not going to go away because there's money to be made speculating on it. You know, traders are fine with zero sum cutthroat markets. You know, if you know what you're going in for, you know that zero is a number, have fun. You know, um, I still think there should be restrictions on marketing this stuff to mum and dad investors because they'll get skinned. But if you're a professional trader who knows your stuff, fine. You know, but um, they want to make sure that you're above board. So we will have cryptos continuing to be a financial instrument but they'll be increasingly regulated and restricted i think that's what the future will hold it'll keep going for years you know um at some point the current price bubble e thing it's not quite a bubble I, there's no sort of consumer input that happens in a bubble no sort of bubble exuberance there's a lot of weird shenanigans going on no one takes the current price rise seriously mm -hmm. it is like it's bizarre it, 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 as I said, peculiarly bloodless. I think that'll collapse, but Bitcoin will keep on ticking. Someone in the chat is asking about um, Lightning Network. Right. So Bitcoin's network clogged. They thought of ways around this. One was to increase the block size, which would have put the problem off a bit longer. Another was to run another network on top. So the real work is not done on Bitcoin. One proposal that someone came up with in 2015 was the Lightning Network. Um, I don't think this is a very good plan in a lot of ways. Um, it's not well thought out. Um, it involves things, it would literally require a pile of new computer science. Um, there's, basically, they plan to build a huge mesh network where you could send money from any person to any other person on the mesh and it would flow through all the other people along the way. This requires how to write, how to route a transaction from one place on a random mesh to another place on a random mesh. That's an unsolved problem in computer science. Like you'll need new mathematics to do this. So that was the strike against it. They said, oh, we'll make it work like BGP does on the internet, which solves this problem. So BGP works, but BGP is also a completely trust-based. You rely on surly telecoms network engineers to keep stuff going and make sure YouTube works today. And if you misbehave, they will chuck you off the network. Like if someone puts in a wrong um, BGP routing, then you break YouTube for a country and they'll cut you off to keep the network going. So it's very much run by people, trust-based and not at all cryptocurrency-like. So, what's happened is lightning has sort of become a lot of very centralized sort of transmission nodes 
and most of them are run by one person and he just puts liquidity into the system because he's a huge fan of lightning and wants it to succeed i mean you know fine but it's centralized it doesn't really have a use case not a lot of people use it and so there's a saying in networking with sufficient thrust pigs fly just fine but it might be a bit messy for the people underneath um so what they're doing is they're getting porky and they're strapping a rocket to him and then they're trying to tell you about his graceful aerobatics and i don't quite buy that so lightning network has been 18 months away since 2015 as a production project mostly it serves as an excuse for bitcoin's terrible transaction record um bitcoin is slow so they are oh, lightning network what are you talking about then you say but it doesn't work properly and has all these problems and so forth. And they say, how dare you? It's a poor little open source project. Why don't you help? So it's brilliant, except when you actually ask, is it brilliant? Then suddenly it's new. So, I mean, I wish them good luck. They are quite sincere, but I can't see this working. And one of the reasons, but the big problem with Lightning Network has is it doesn't really have a use case. Its use case is the merchant case for Bitcoin buying coffee with bitcoin that doesn't work because bitcoin isn't used for merchant cases even when the bitcoin network was fast and clear people would try to get um, merchants to take up accepting bitcoin you should take bitcoin nag you spam you and they say fine fine we're taking bitcoin then two years later they'd switch it off because basically no one bought stuff with it and um then bitcoiners would say how dare you and they get much more emails protesting about it being switched off than they had actual people using it. Bitcoiners don't use their Bitcoins. They hold on to them in case they go up. They don't spend them like money. Yeah. The speculation case and the current and the um, payment case are opposite. Like no one uses gold as a transaction mechanism. You know, it's something you have for jewelry, teeth, electronics, or putting in a great big pile to look at. Even then, people don't tend to like have bars of gold in their house. They'll buy representations of gold that's sitting in a vault somewhere. So, you know, um, I mean, Lightning Network, it's the right sort of idea, but the, the actual architecture of the plan and stuff doesn't really work and doesn't really have a use case, I think. So if it takes off, good luck, and I will be delighted to see it do so, but I don't think it will. Well, I see another question in the chat. What about China's digital currency? So that's chapter 15 of the Libra Shrugged book <laughs> because China basically, so the People's Bank of China, every central bank works really hard coming up with schemes. What if someone does a stupid thing it becomes really popular? How stable will the economy be? Because a central bank's job, they're a public institution designed to keep your country's economy on an even keel. That's their job, right? They're not under direct democratic control. They're usually independent. They can decide interest rates independently and so on. But um, if they break the economy, then people will be marching in the streets expecting them to fix it. So they're public institutions. So central banks have to plan for weird stuff happening. What happens if Bitcoin becomes popular? What will this do to the economy? And so on. So the People's Bank of China is no exception. They had a blockchain unit um, who worked on this stuff because they were interested because it is interesting. And actually it is their job to look at weird stuff. That's very important. You have to look at weird stuff so it doesn't surprise you. So that's good. And they had this plan for what if we did a digital currency, a digital yuan, the Chinese currency, the renminbi, commonly known as the yuan. Um, what would this do? Would it be useful? And so on. This was mostly theoretical, like research papers, until Facebook announced Libra. The People's Bank of China went, oh, that's bad. We better do something about this because they didn't want the threat of Facebook coming in and stamping all over them. So they put into place plans to make this a reality. It's progressing along. Um, I think they're going to do it. So what it is, is it's a payment system, right? It's sort of got, it's not quite a blockchain. It's blockchain-ish. It's got something blockchain-ish at the back end, I think. Um, they 
but for the user, it's a payment system, right? Central bank digital currencies aren't actually interesting unless you're a banker, in which case you care a whole lot about who the money is a liability against, you know, is it a liability against the bank? Is it a liability against the person, against the company, against the central bank? This is very important if you're a banker. If you're just you or me, it's not important. We care about spending money. Is this a dollar? Can we spend it? So the same thing ha happens with DCEP. Now, China has good payment systems, Alipay and WeChat Pay. They're huge and they're private. So I think the reasons for DCEP, um, its name is DCEP, by the way, in Latin letters, the Chinese thing with the name in Latin letters, um, DC slash EP, that's what the papers all call it. So it's um, a currency on your phone, you can buy things with it, you wave your phone or it shows a QR code or whatever. So you go on public transport, buy your um, coffee with it, buy big things, buy small things, it's money. Um, so China is a bit worried about the large private payment providers. They're getting a bit too bossy and big for their boots. Um, they're worried about the hegemony of the US dollar. Everyone who isn't the US worries about that. Um, they're worried about Facebook's Libra and they would quite like the world to adopt a digital Chinese currency. That'd be really cool. Then they could be have hegemony like the US. Uh, it's not clear the world's that interested in it. Um, they want dollars, but um, so fine. So they're doing this thing. They've been running increasingly bigger and bigger tests for it, which they, they say, they don't use the word pilot. They say testing, internal testing, strictly restricted. For some reason, they won't say the word pilot, but they're pilots. Um, they did one recently in Shanghai, I think, earlier, which finished in October, where they gave people about $30 worth of yuan and said, go spend it. And merchant fees were zero. So that was attractive to the shops because Ali and WeChat charge a fee. And people spent it. It was fine. But they weren't very interested because it didn't do anything that existing systems didn't. The problem there is that DCEP, they started with a blockchain. They thought, what can we use this for? Then they came up with the system. Then they realized blockchain wouldn't scale and they took the blockchain bit out. Um, that's the wrong way around. You have a problem, then you solve the problem. Like this is in the book, the Bahamas sand dollar. Um, which is a digital currency in the Bahamas. They had a problem. People on outer islands didn't have banks because commercial banks didn't bother. So they, um, instead they went, right, well, the, the commercial banks won't do it. They usually do payment systems, but we need to step in. So the central bank stepped in and made a system that poor people could use because everyone had a smartphone, even if they were poor but network connectivity was spotty. So they came up with a system with a phone. You could transmit money directly between phones to small amounts. If it worked through your bank, you could use that. It worked through sort of your local hole in the wall money changer, you could use them. Um, so that's the system they're working on. It seems to be going reasonably well because they started with a problem, looked at the conditions and then came up with a solution, which is the correct way around. Blockchain has a real problem with people saying, we've got a solution. Wonder what's the problem we can use it for. So I think DCEP will launch. I don't know how much usage it'll get. I don't think it's really made its use case clear to people. I'm pretty sure they'll launch something maybe next year. We'll see. I mean, they won't launch until they're quite sure because China is huge and nothing happens at small scale. They really want this to be a currency for a billion people, you know. So they're being as careful as you should be. And that's good. Yeah, well, it seems to me like everyone believes that this is going to turn into something huge and valuable someday. And we should all invest in it now to be on the ground floor. But I don't DCP. see any. No, blockchain in general. Um, I would say no. <laughs> that's my feeling too. What's the point? Um. I mean, my takeaway from this is that it's 
very it's not good it's somewhat scammy people sell you on stuff that doesn't exist and can't work and really i would be very happy if everyone here looked at what i'm saying and thought twice before getting into the blockchain world there's a lot of money in it usually other people's money um <laughs> yep you can make money as a trader and you can lose your shirt because it's a pool full of sharks and there's no regulators and you can just lose all your money. Um, if you're a experienced trader who's been burnt before and you know that sometimes your money just goes, maybe you'll get rich. You probably won't, but you might. I will never say you can't get rich from it. So use cases for blockchain as a slow distributed database, I don't know any. Um, as I said, if you have a good system that works and it happens to use a blockchain as this backend data store, I wouldn't rip it out if it's a working system. You know, I've seen some terrible things. I've seen PHP four in production systems in the last five years, that sort of thing. You know, um, that I would probably rip out, but you know, <laughs> it's, yeah. I'm a system administrator. I've seen bad systems, you know, like I approach this saying, right, my job is looking at technologies and telling the bad ones, how does this shape up? Wow, that's terrible. And yeah, because um, I don't see a use case for blockchain outside of cryptocurrencies. And as use cases go, I'm, I have a few problems with that one, but I am perfectly willing to be convinced, but I can say that after like, it's been 12 years of this stuff, the burden of proof is a hundred percent on the people who say it's great, yeah. right? They'll say stuff like time will tell, you know, time has told it's been 12 years. They'll say, but it's like the early internet. And I just go, listen, mate, I was on the internet before you were born. And you know, it's always people who weren't born then who tell me just what the internet was like in 1993. And I'm going, what? But you know, the internet comparison is bad because Technologies don't just succeed because they've been around for ages. Most technologies fail. The Gartner hype cycle is a marketing lie. Most technologies just crash out. Often deserving ones crash out. Very few come back. I think the last one I can think of that came back was flash memory. When it, flash memory came out, nobody wanted it. It was slow and too expensive. Finally, the technological curves changed such that it was more effective. And now, of course, it's one. But um, that was, every example is different. There's no reason that blockchains will become popular just because they're old. Most technologies just die out. And also the internet had clear use cases at literally every step. People were doing real work with this thing at literally every step of its progress. This is not the case with Bitcoin. Success is always in the future. And whenever you hear someone say, but blockchain could, that's a word meaning blockchain doesn't because if it did, they'd say blockchain does. They can't say that. So they say blockchain could. So don't believe the hype. S nod, smile, and don't believe any claim until you have the thing working in front of you. Don't believe technological um, teleology that things must progress in a certain way. Cause you know, that's false. Technology is terrible stuff. It goes wrong and weird all the time. You know, a few minor problems in pricing and suddenly your technology has failed. Stuff like that. Um, yeah. Are there further? I'm not looking at the chat, so I'm rely on you to look at it for me. Fine. Uh, there's I've only one more question there. They, they're asking what percentage of IT jobs do you think will be long-term remote because the virus has moved a lot of things remote? As many as possible. Yeah. I mean, like my job is completely remote now. I'm very happy that way. I much prefer it. I hate commuting so much. The office can get in the sea. Other people feel differently. There is a place for offices. You know, we have a lot of, I have a lot of coworkers. We're a publishing company I work at. And like, we have a lot of people who are not technologists and they really need to do things face to face a lot. And some of them are really suffering and we've got to fix that. So Zoom can't do everything. But um, IT, I mean, I haven't set foot in a server room for 
quite a few years now and I am extremely pleased by that. I hope never to set foot in a server room again. I hope never to touch a server rack again. My job is administering things at AWS via a terminal. And that is correct. So yeah, but I foresee, I don't foresee some sort of unemployment crisis in IT because technology is terrible and computers don't work, right? This is because they're designed by humans for humans and humans are a pain in the backside. And like, you know, it's my joke is non-technical person. Computers are terrible. It's massively magical and hate me. Newbie, techie. Ha ha, how, how can you say that? It's a deterministic machine. You just need to learn about it. Senior IT person. Yeah, it's magic. It probably does hate you. It certainly hates me. Don't trust it. Computers don't work. And uh, anyone who's experience knows this don't trust software software is dumb and bad it's written by programmers and we're really bad at this so yeah um as long as there's broken systems there will be work for sysadmins because here in the future nothing works okay well i guess uh that's it then the oh. questions. thank you very much 20 past 10 yeah. yes um thank you all very much um if you have any further questions i'll send um, the PDF over and uh, come by my Twitter, David Gerard, my blog, davidgerard.co.uk. If you search for David Gerard or David Gerard Bitcoin, you'll definitely find me. I have the best SEO in the world because I've been posting since 1995. Yeah. And the books are fun. I love your books. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, if you do live Jen, the books, all I ask of you is tell everyone. <laughs> it's marketing as far as I'm concerned. Tell people about the book. That's the one thing I ask of you. And if you like the paperback, it's a really nice paper book and it's really gorgeous and you'll like it. Yeah, if you look in the chat, everyone's saying thank you and they say thank you for your social justice endeavors, which <laughs> I don't know about. Uh, well, mostly I just tweet about good and nice things and how to be nice to people. So, yeah. Well, that's, that's an unusual thing to do. The Twitter feed is me pretty much unvarnished. So, yes. All right, good. Well, I really appreciate you doing this and I'll put it up on YouTube and send you the link on Twitter. Um, thank you very much. I shall leave and you can say good night to the class. Okay. Bye well. now. <laughs>